I don't think competition is good for everybody. Some people are very good at it. I mean, you can, you can see tennis players who are outstanding tennis players, but at, at very difficult moments, they, they're under pressure. They don't play as well as they, they could. There are other people who respond very positively to that sort of pressure, and they're the ones who win. On the other hand, they're not necessarily playing the best tennis. I mean, that's the sort of analogy I would make. And I think um, on, that some people in science and stuff, they, they're better at doing what they want and they don't go for competition. It's not that I don't like competition, I don't think it's necessarily helpful. There are other scientists who think they like this. I mean, my colleague Rick Smalley, uh, when he, um, who unfortunately died a few years ago, he said, uh, yes, he loves competition and he was that sort of person. Who, he said, we need that to get, get people, young people to uh, do great things, or that. but I don't think, for me, that's not necessary. I'm not interested in what other people are doing. I'm just interested in what I want to do. And um, I think if people are competing, then that's not necessarily something which interests me because I'm interested in doing something which nobody else is interested in. Although I played tennis as well. I mean, my, uh, that's a competitive sport. I wasn't. I was quite a good tennis player, but I didn't respond well to pressure that sport does. So I, I think one should play sport, for instance, just to be for enjoyment. And I think when one watches sort of uh, competitive sport, it brings something which is non-sportsmanlike into the into it. I think the same is true of science. If you, I mean, why you don't do? I don't do science to compete with somebody else to win prizes. I just do science because it's a good living. It's something I'm quite good at. I wouldn't say I'm brilliant at it, but uh, something that uh, in sometimes I enjoy doing. I don't do it to win prizes. I didn't do science to win prizes. I didn't, we didn't make that discovery to win the Nobel Prize. It never never crossed my mind that uh, to win prizes. Uh, when I first when I did some science, it was nice, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I deserve some award or a medal for this. And then when we made the discovery of C60, after a while, being clear that it's important, then you thought, well, maybe it'll win this award, but it had no bearing on the way that I approach science. And in some ways, it's it's very artificial. I mean, I'm not saying I don't, I mean, I've, obviously I'm very, what's the word, proud, pride is a sin, but whatever it is, obviously it's, there's some pros and cons to the prize. And uh, I, I'm very pleased that we got the prize. But I don't think it's all positive. You know, there are some lots of negative aspects of it, and I think young people shouldn't go into anything to win prizes. That's why I don't like competition. I don't like people going into a sport to uh, athletics to win prizes or um, and be disappointed if they don't win the Olympic Games. I think this brings a, a very negative aspect into sport, and I think it brings a very negative aspect into science. When, say, some scientists who spend their whole life bothered about the fact that they didn't win an award here, there and everywhere. Uh, and, and that bothers me. If I hadn't won the Nobel Prize, um, perhaps things that I um, would prefer to be doing, which is my, I've got a major interest in art and graphics and I, I don't have the time that I would, I don't have enough time to do that. Um, and. The point is that winning the Nobel Prize um, means I feel some sort of responsibility very often uh, to represent some people within the scientific community on issues which I think are important. And particularly today in the fact that there's tremendous um, uh, pressure on the, in the Enlightenment. I think uh, free thinking and these issues are very important and are under threat today. I'm an atheist and um, Whatever that is, agnostic atheist. I'm not going to find touch. I mean, I and I think that most science is atheistic, and there are a few scientists, less than 10 percent, who believe in God. But of the major scientists, 90, more than 90 percent are atheists, and they transfer their own the aspects of science to their everyday life, which I think is an intellectual um, is, issue for me. Um, I. It's not that I don't need some mystical thing, it's just that I don't accept it. And I think people who do accept it, they have a tremendous Achilles heel um, in the sense that they accept anything, any old story from anywhere, a thousand years old, <laughs> which is no evidence. And these people bother me because they're in positions of power and responsibility. And when people 
are prepared to accept you know, one of 20 or 30 different stories from thousands of years ago. I wonder what else they're prepared to accept when it comes to decisions which affect me. And so that's one responsibility and I have, I have a, a position, I feel a position to say something about that. A good example is something I'll mention on Wednesday is that in the States there's a museum, a, a creation museum where they, they tell young ch children, school children, that the earth is only four and a half thousand years old. When it's pretty clear it's, you know, a lot older than that from scientific measurements which all fit together from every aspect of science indicate the earth is four and a half billion years old. They tell children that the Grand Canyon was carved by Noah's flood 4,350 years ago, which is a load of crap, I mean total nonsense. And yet school children are going there. Now it bothers me that we're getting a whole generation who are children who will be abused by people who we've got no control over. We've got governors of states in the USA who think this way and therefore are bringing in legislation so that school teachers are having to tell their children um, this, this thing. I think the world is now in a very dangerous situation where these lunatics are actually having, getting control of education and also uh, control over many aspects, even here in the, in the European Union. And that bothers me. Um, now, I'm evidence-based and I don't accept anything without evidence. And also, I don't accept the evidence uh, without looking at it critically and saying, yes, I think this looks right. Uh, or in complex systems saying, well, you know, it's probably right. I mean, a complex system would be global warming. It's very complex, very, very complex issue. The evidence suggests, as we heard today, that we got a problem. I'm not absolutely sure, but I'm fairly sure. And therefore I say, okay, we, we got to do something about it because if it is right, we're in deep shit. I mean, really, probably big problems. And I think that's where a scientist stands. So these are the, the responsibilities of someone who's a Nobel Prize winner in a position to, to, to say these things. Of course, when you say them to people, um, they often don't like it. And they don't, but so when they're, when they're, when you undermine the, when you take away the crutch under which is helping some people to survive, it, it's a problem. I don't take it, the crutch away from people for whom it's very important and they're not, not influential. But I think we have to really wipe the crutch from underneath governors of states in the USA or people who are contending for president of the USA. That bothers me very much because if they're prepared to accept say religious dogma what else are they prepared to accept are they prepared to accept or th believe without evidence that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq which is the case and I think that's an, an example which I think people should think about